Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics here with the Better Not Pout Stocking Ornament tutorial that we told you about when we introduced this club a few weeks back now. I guess it's been almost a month now. Um, you know, a lot of people have been saying, I don't want to wait until this club starts to figure out, can I make this? Here's the great news. I've already filmed the tutorial when we released the club the first time, and that is available for YouTube Right now, you can go watch that or watch this here, right at the end of this here, this intro segment. We will roll right into that. And the mechanics of literally from opening the package to having a finished ornament, every single detail is covered. It's about an hour and 10 minutes. So get some popcorn, your favorite drink. But if you're a beginner, I know what that's like. I've been there. I don't want to wonder about any step along the way. I want to be confident that if I invest in this club, I can absolutely do it and you can. And that's what those videos are all about. That video is all about. So just like before, everything's cut out for you. It makes it so much fun. You're not tracing, you're not cutting, or worrying about the precision of your cutting. Is it cut out perfectly? It will be. Your kit, just like we did before, everything's pre-cut. The uh, applique, previews, and laser cut. This is the thread set this year. So when you watch the video for really how does this go together, You'll see slightly different fabrics. Uh, we used as much of the Better Not Pout fabrics as we could find. And then we filled in with Nancy's other collection, Wanda Lane 1 and 2, and her Whisper Weave 1 and 2. And we think these uh, stockings are just as darling as the first time around. Of course, Nancy's fabrics are always adorable. Um, so be sure to check out that full tutorial if you're curious, how does this go together? Or if you're already a veteran and you already know this, Get your spot and get a friend to get signed up as well because it's always fun to craft together. These are the notions uh, that you will see us use in the video and possibly more. And if you haven't already subscribed, be sure to do that right now. So much more coming your way. I'll join you over on that full tutorial to show you how to put these darling stockings together in about an hour and 10 minutes. These adorable ornaments are part of the Better Not Pout Ornament Club. And that is included in this amazing book by Nancy Halverson, Art to Heart, prints this, and it is full of incredible projects. And when we saw the ornaments, we said we are absolutely doing that. Everything, everything is already cut out for you and ready to go. So I, of course, you can always grab that book um, and just follow the instructions, but I love to be able to take you through the journey and give you some pointers of maybe where we deviated a little bit from the instructions and then you have the option of doing what's included in the book or maybe what I'll be showing you today. So um, as always, uh, if you are not already in the Better Not Pout Ornament Club and there's spots still available, which I hope there are for you to jump into the fun, you don't want to miss out, grab your spot and grab a friend. This is one that's going to be really a lot of fun. Two ornaments a month for six months and you have, of course, uh, 12 beautiful ornaments to display in your tree, or maybe you keep some and give some away, whatever you want it to do. So in your kit, I want to just go over that. I just gra randomly grabbed one. It happens to be the Santa ornament, but in your very first shipment, you'll get this entire book. Of course, it has the 12 um, ornaments included and all of the instructions, but again, all of these other amazing projects and uh, there will be many available on the Shabby Fabrics website as well, towels and hot pads and more. So there's a lot going on. In each shipment, you will get, of course, as we said, all of everything is, is cut out for you. And of course, applique shapes are pre-fused and laser cut. You don't even need to worry about that. So we'll, as we jump into the book, you'll see we're going to be able to skip ahead right away. You don't have to make templates. You don't have to be tracing things out. We've done that for you. And any ornament that has buttons, and most of them do, will also be included. You want to make sure you take good care of those. They're tiny. Some of them are tiny. And some of them are even handcrafted. Uh, the, the candy cane, the nose of the snowman are made by hand. I love that. Okay, so let's jump into that. Let's open up our book. Our thread set will absolutely come into play as we're stitching down our applique. I'm going to take you through the entire ornament um, from start to finish. So you, will, we have decided to include a layout diagram for you, and you'll see very soon why that's important. What's included inside the book is reverse refusable applique diagrams. And again, you don't have to worry about that because we've already cut everything out 
for you. But when you get ready to assemble the applique elements, you don't have a layout diagram available to you in the book. And so we've provided one in addition so that it's going to make it easier for you. But step one, before we get into the applique, talks about sewing the cuff of the ornament uh, of the stocking first. So let's just, let's just break down what's included. Applique shapes, of course, let's put those up there for just a moment. And we have, this is the hanger. I'll have a variation of that on the hanger as an option as we get a little bit further along. We have our stocking front and back. This is a double-sided fusible fleece, and you'll see why that fusible fleece being uh, fusible on both sides instead of just one is so handy. We have a lining fabric also cut out for you, and our two uh, cuffs that are the top, uh, both the front and the back. So our very first step inside our instructions, they talk about cutting. You can skip ahead to that. And our very first under stocking front is sew a stocking top piece to the top of the stocking front and we'll press the seam to the stocking top. So I'm gonna get my iron warming up. So what they're talking about here, and you could actually do both the front and the back at the same time. So that's a time saving thing and we'll go ahead and do that. Now right away, I wanna point out one thing. There are certain uh, tops of that, the, the cuff, I would call it, that has directional fabric, it has words. So some of them are, are not, where it doesn't really matter. But on those that are, make sure that you're orienting that top portion so that the writing is right side up. So let's go ahead, once we're sure of that, flip that right side together. And I'm gonna do the same with this. If you need to put a quick pin in there, go ahead and do that just so nothing shifts. And we'll sew with a standard quarter inch seam allowance. Let's go do that right now. Okay, so our instructions in the book mention to press the seam to the stocking top. Later on, it also has you do the same step for the stocking back and also press to the top. That's one of the first things I want to change. We will go ahead and press one of them, it doesn't actually matter which, toward the top, but I wanna press the other one toward the bottom. Later on, you'll see why that decision may be very helpful for you because we'll get some nice interlocking seams. So on this one, instead of pressing to the top, I'm gonna to go ahead and open that up and I'm gonna to press toward the bottom here. I always like to have interlocking seams because as you can imagine later on, these will end up being right side together and having that interlocking seam is really important. So that's part of what I do here at Shabby Fabrics is you know, examine a pattern and say, hey, there may be a step here that may be helpful for people. And I wanna mention that. So that's your up to you whether you want to do that or not. But I always wanna include that as, a, as something for you to at least consider. Okay, so we've sewn the stocking top to the stocking and we did it for the front and the back, why not? We're already at that point. Our next step is it says, follow the instructions for fusible applique and trace and do all that stuff. Don't worry about that. We're not gonna do any kind of tracing. We're gonna jump straight away into our light box. We have our layout diagram and I'll be using my AppleFuse um, mat, which I love to be able to, I'll show you where we're gonna go with this. We're gonna take these pieces and we're gonna pre-assemble them and that's what we're gonna get. We are not going to be bringing pieces onto the background one by one. We're going to use this trio of, of things along with a pressing mat and an iron on medium heat to be able to pre-assemble that, which I love that. I love the precision of it. I'm dealing with one piece and not all of those other little pieces and moving them onto the background. So how do you do that? Well, once you get your applique shapes, of course, your first step, they have heat and bond light on the back. So you'll just wanna roll this back just like that and you'll see that right away the paper releases. So you'll just wanna go ahead and remove all of those. And we've done the others ahead of time just to save a little bit of time. Now looking at the layout diagram, I wanna point out a couple things about the layout diagram. 
Anything that's numbered, number one is your piece that would go down first, followed by piece two and three and so on and so forth. So we've already taken that layering into account for you. Make sure you're following that very carefully that that piece lays down first. And it's not intuitive sometimes when you look at something, you're like, I can't tell what that piece is that's furthest back. You don't have to worry about that. We've taken care of it. And dashed lines mean that this piece right here lies behind the beard and that makes sense. That part's showing, but this part back here is not because the beard is on top of that. One thing that I have definitely found helpful is when I get ready to lay out an applique um, uh, block, is I like to get a familiarity with where those pieces go before I put my Applifuse mat down. Here's why. Once you put this down and you put this on there, and I always have to keep my light box a little bit dimmer, you can see where it's a little bit harder to see the numbers. It's nice to know where things go before you put that mat down. So what I'm going to do before I do that is, and you could have an extra work table next to you, I'll just use my wool pressing mat, is I'm just going to get familiar with, okay, my piece one is gonna go down here, and it looks like our beard will be down in here, followed by our face, will be here about like that and our cheeks these are fun you can like figure out which rotation you know the plaid is so cute okay three four five six is looks like our mustache so i might just put that here like that it's just giving you a general idea of what's to come like that and we're going to have some holly we're giving you all kinds of options, even including some hand embroidery options, maybe some machine embroidery options for adding the little bit of vein. We did that. These are extra things that are not included into the book, but we thought that was fun to be able to add some dimension. You could do that with hand embroidery. We'll cover that later. Or you could do that with machine uh, stitching or not at all. So giving you plenty of options to customize it for whatever you prefer. Okay, so we know where we're going to go with our layout in general. So our step one will be to turn our light box on. And this is the wafer one light box. This is the smallest light box out of the trio of three. They have one, two, and three, and three is quite large. For this project, you'll never need more than uh, the wafer one. But if you like to do applique and you envision your, yourself doing larger projects, you might consider the two or even the three. The Apple Fuse mat also comes in two sizes, this being the smallest. And again, if you like to do big projects, consider using the larger mat. Um, I'd actually have them both because that bigger mat can be very awkward to use when you're working with a small project. So that's one where I think you can get one light box to satisfy your need, but potentially consider both of those Apple Fuse mats if you use a variety of sizes of projects. Okay, this has a tackiness to it. So as I set this down right inside that footprint, I can push this down and it's not coming off there. There's a really neat characteristic about this mat that I absolutely love that is like no other mat that I've probably ever used before where they tend to be slick. And if I bump them, pieces move. What's really cool too about this is if it gets, if it loses its tackiness, they tell you, you can literally put this in your dishwasher and run it through the cycle and it's tacky again and ready to go. So I love that they are just, you can keep that tackiness characteristic about it. Okay, piece number two is gonna go down next. And then three, what I believe was our face. Now, if you're ever not sure, you can just pull that back and I can see that in there. And then I see our cheeks are next. Cute. Nancy Halverson is easily one of my favorite designers. And Nancy Halverson is a designer for Benertex. This is the Better Not Pout uh, Christmas collection from Benertex. And as I'm laying this out, I'm just checking my position to make sure I've got everything. His beard is next. Why I'm so excited about this collection, besides just the versatility, we have the Noel sampler happening, so many projects is Nancy doesn't always have a collection going. So when she comes out with one, it's really special. 
um, people know that it's it's very it's wonderful fabric and they tend to really collect that fabric um, because she always has these amazing projects that go along with it and we just have such a good time uh, doing all of the projects in her books okay that piece goes down next and then I can see where I can see one of the hollies the other one is a little bit harder to see. Now, if I was home, I'd turn this light box up as bright as I can get it. And that's one of the coolest things about this light box is that it can get brighter and dimmer as you prefer. And I can always look at the book. Of course, I have a picture of those ornaments and say, where is that? Or I can just peel that back and say, you know, is that, yep, that's exactly where I want it to be. I check absolutely everything if I want to make any adjustments. This is the time to do it. Once you believe you have everything where you want it to be, now we carefully move this over. I'm gonna actually dial that down to a medium heat real quick. I might steam some of that out real fast, cool that down. Typically you wanna have this on a medium heat and I would get that steam, go ahead and get that turned off. You're just going to want to press straight down, no rotation of your hand because now pieces can move, of course. So I'm very deliberate about in this area, I let that just warm up in this area, but no shifting. I just don't want to do that. Super, super fun. Okay, one thing I have learned as this is cooling down is my temptation is always to take it off right away. Well, as you can imagine, there's actually something happening. The glue is melting and merging together to make them one piece. You need to let that process happen. You could blow on it. You could, you know, go off and do another project for just a couple minutes. Let it cool down and you'll get a very clean takeaway. And while that's cooling down, I just want to get a close up of that. And you can see that how everything, the glue is still here. We're not leaving any glue on the Aplifuse mat, which I love. Now I feel confident that I've probably waited long enough, but I want you to see this. I want you to see me literally taking it off of here and the merging that has happened. Do you see that? And there is absolutely zero residue left. It is incredible technology. I absolutely love it. Now I have one thing to think about. So our next step, we'll get this side and I'll move my Applifuse mat. We're all done with that. And I love that it just rolls up and it can just be stored away in your craft room, ready to go for your next project. Of course, you'll get to use that 12 times. That is super fun. As you can see, this sits right in the saddle, just like this. just like that. And we'll go ahead and just iron that down. How fun is that? And how fast was that? You know, before this technology, I would bring piece one to the background, piece two to the back. I didn't have a layout diagram. I was literally going visual. And you can imagine with a face, you need it to be right. And of course, it didn't quite look like the picture. It was in the ballpark, but I love the precision of having the layout diagram, being able to have this as one piece, and now I'm ready to go. So our next step here is you can imagine in the book, they're wanting you to go ahead and stitch it down. This is again a choice you can make. You can either take this to the machine now and stitch that down with the coordinating thread, picking the thread that you know coordinates best with that. So we'll pick our red. I would say that's a natural pick. Our pink for our cheeks. We've got a couple greens for our holly and for our beard. I'm gonna pick this one and for the whites, I would pick that. So that's gonna be my thread that we'll, we will use. I'm gonna put those aside real quick. One thing I wanna offer you as an option is you could stitch that down now or what we went ahead and did, let me move this out of the way since we're done using that. I won't use that again today is you can go ahead 
move that book out of our way. And you could put the double-sided fusible fleece on now, along with the lining behind it, just like this, and iron it together. And this will be short of the top of this, and this is normal. Why we did that is we were able to quilt it while we were appliquing it down. In the book, they mentioned about appliquing it here without those layers on and later quilting it. Well, we felt that it'd be really fun and give it a more embossed look to go ahead and put the double-sided fusible fleece and the lining on now. And then when we're stitching it down, it just has this beautiful chisel look and embossed. And that's what you're seeing. That's how we did do our ornaments. So I'll go ahead and take you through that. Again, that's a decision that you can make, whatever you're comfortable with. So when we'll line that up so they're stacked perfectly. And isn't that nice? Everything is cut for you. Um, it was difficult to actually source the double-sided fusible fleece because most fusible fleece is on a single side. But I wanted you to be able to, in one fell swoop, put it all together and not have anything loose. Because if this was attached to this because it had fusible, but this wasn't, in the process of stitching this down, it could start slipping around. That's why we went ahead and made the investment in your kits to go ahead and have not one side to be fusible, but both. That way nothing is going to move. Now I'm gonna go ahead and actually iron it down from this side. I want to have a lot of heat on this to release that glue, and I don't wanna be on the side that has all of that uh, fusible webbing on it. I want to stay away from that. And don't be afraid to put a little bit of steam on there and activate that glue. Okay, so now I have one thing. I only have to deal with one thing. Now the fun thing is, not that this isn't all fun, right? Yeah, I love it. I love every step of this. I really love, you know, like how can we make it so it has that different look? That's one of my favorite things about getting to create things every day here at Shabby is I'm gonna go ahead and start stitching things down. Now what we did with ours is we went ahead and did a straight stitch on most of the shapes, but then on the, uh, just to add some texture and fun, we did a blanket stitch on his beard and on his mustache. Pick another stitch you love, something completely different. You might even want to add some metallic thread of your own. Of course, we have a, a beautiful selection of that as well. If you decide to add the veins of that uh, and you want to go ahead and stitch that by hand, I will cover that. Or you can go ahead and do that by a machine or not at all. It's not even included in this particular block. So that's kind of a bonus. And that's that creative liberty we get to take as makers, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and rethread my machine. And we'll go ahead and start off with just a simple straight stitch. Then we'll go ahead and do a blanket stitch. I'll show you those. I'll finish stitching that off camera. Um, when we come back, I'll just go over it. Hey, if you wanna do that by hand and do some hand embroidery, I'll show you those options of a back stitch and a blanket stitch. I'll show you that you can choose it or not. Or you could just do a straight stitch in a beautiful coordinating green thread in the light green here and the dark green over there as you choose. Again, it's your project, make it yours. So I'm gonna rethread my machine and we'll be right back. Okay, so I've put the super nonstick size 8012 needle in there. This needle is engineered absolutely for fusible webbing. We'll start off with, I've shortened my stitch length to just a 2.0. I'm on start sewing on the Bernina 770, and I have a 20C, only because I want to be able to see where I'm going, and some of the other presser feet might block my view. But find the presser foot that's best for you. We'll start off with a straight stitch going around uh, Santa's hat. In fact, let me get the sample for you. So you can see what we're going to do is we'll just mimic I'll try to mimic <laughs> the really nice sewing um, that Linda did on here and do a straight stitch. We'll end that and then let's come back and we'll do a blanket stitch. And as you can see, because all of this is going to be caught in the seam allowance, you don't need to stitch around this part. We'll just be doing the blanket stitch down to the edge 
So that is this true of anything that's going to be caught in the seam allowance, no matter what ornament you're doing. So you just want to always keep in mind, you don't need to be doing that stitching. It's extra work you don't need to do. All right, so let's get started. And uh, you're just going to pick thread, of course, that coordinates best out of your thread set. Secure that. And my goal will just be trying to keep the same distance from the edge all the way around. As you get near, I like to have my finger on the reverse button so I don't extend into my holly. There we go. We don't want to do that. Okay, I'll skip over that holly and just get that last little section right there. And that's going to be a little bit tricky. Now I wish I'd moved my um, holly so that it pivoted so because you can see there's just a little spot there heck you could even skip that no one's gonna wash these ornaments right i might even just skip that little section and just do this part here one thing i've learned about um cotton applique in fact we're going to have a little impromptu thing here i want to show you something i want to this i was not planning to do this but that seems to be what we do at Shabby <laughs> as things happen. I want to show you how, if you're like, you know what? I don't really like that. I want to angle that just a little bit more. We're going to go over to the iron. I'm going to heat this up again. You're going to see it be able to release and I'm going to move it just a little bit. So if I really wanted to get into that spot, it's, that'd be very difficult to stitch and not get my thread on there. I'm going to show you how to do that real quick. This is kind of a bonus. So if you do misplace something, not all is lost. Don't worry. And then um, we'll come back and we're going to stitch this down. Um, so let's, let me go do that with you real quick. I just want to show it to you while we're talking about it. So I'll move my iron out here. So this is a trick that we've learned because of mistakes. So you heat it up and you need to move very quickly to take it, pivot it, where you want it to be. So let's say I want it to be out there. So I absolutely don't have that little spot. Then you can heat it right back down. So that's just something that we've learned is a possibility and it's just good to go. You need to move really quick again, like I said. Okay, let's get back to it. So I'm going to set up my machine now to go ahead and do a blanket stitch. And I always recommend that you practice on some scrap fabric. Now I'm familiar with my settings on the Bernina, so I'm comfortable. Make sure you've got this rope plate in there that doesn't have the two single circles because that's not, that's going to be problematic and break your needle. So make sure you've got the proper throat plate in there. All right, let's get started. I'm comfortable with that because again, I've, I've just been fiddling around with the Bernina lately with my blanket stitch, but find your preferred and we'll just get started. Of course, with the blanket stitch, I want you to be able to see this. The needle is coming onto the background, but just barely. Because I have a cream thread, if I go too far onto my background, it's going to be very unsightly. This is tracking exactly along that line. So if you're uncomfortable or not, you don't use blanket stitch very often, I definitely want to encourage you to either practice on some fabric and if you're just not comfortable pick another stitch another decorative stitch or just do a straight stitch
Okay, so let's see how we did. And that's a big beefy stitch, right? So if you want a, a more subtle stitch, just dial that down to a different stitch. Maybe not, maybe spread that out, maybe not as wide. But we, I like a bold stitch. It's country, it's cute. We're making a statement um, and it's notable. I, I really like that. Now, when we get ready to go do our beard, we have, looks like we spaced the stitches out a little bit further and then we did some straight stitch. So I'm gonna go ahead and stitch all of that off camera. But before I do that, I wanna talk about this right here. Again, that's a bonus. In the pattern, there's no embroidery whatsoever. Don't ever feel compelled to go to that next level if you don't wanna do that. If you do, you could absolutely just do a straight stitch with thread uh, on your machine and pick, you know, you may even want to choose actually the opposites where you pick the darker green here and the lighter green there if you really want it to stand out or you just do them or you can do it by hand. So I'm gonna grab a piece of uh, cotton fabric and I'm gonna show you a simple, this is a stem stitch that you may opt to do in some of the ornaments or a back stitch, which you will need to do on a couple of those. So I'm definitely gonna cover those. So let me go ahead and get some cotton fabric out. I'm gonna show you that. Off camera, I will finish stitching this down. I think, I think today, I'm gonna go ahead and sew those on by machine just to show you the difference of what that looks like. And then once we come back, we're gonna continue through the assembly of how to put the stocking together. Okay, so I've got my embroidery floss and you'll just grab whatever the color out of your stash that is coordinates. We don't have embroidery floss included with this program. COVID-19 created some real challenges in getting embroidery floss. So go ahead and grab out of your stash any embroidery floss you think you might wanna use. And again, you can always just use sewing thread. Um, nothing, nothing magical about using embroidery floss instead of that, just an option for you. Okay, so if you do wanna go ahead and put, draw those lines on and you decide you wanna do those by hand, just draw those on like a leaf would be, and you can either use that as a target with your machine, or if you wanna do that by embroidery floss, we'll just cover that here. Just know you're going through a lot more layers here, including fusible webbing. This needle will absolutely handle it, no problem but you, don't, you wanna make sure you have a nice sharp point to go through all those layers. So let's start off with, since we did do the stem stitch here, how you do the stem stitch is you come up and you're gonna come down a certain distance. Whatever that distance is, keep that distance in your memory. We're gonna split that distance halfway in between and we're gonna come up on that line. That is how I'm trapping that thread with my thumb, the floss I should say. Whatever side you trap that on, keep doing that on that same side. Now I'm gonna come down, and I've again trapped that with my thumb, and I come up. See that twisting that's happening? It's a really cool stitch. It's a nice alternative to a back stitch. A little more texture. and that is the stem stitch. Now to end it, you would just hop over to the other side and turn over and tie off as you normally would. Of course, going under that once. I always like to actually tie off twice. Okay, just like that. Now this back stitch business. What are we doing with this back stitch? Very straightforward. Come up. We'll go down a distance. Again, keep that distance in your memory. You'll go down that same distance and now you work back toward yourself and that's why we call it a back stitch. As you just come back to yourself. Down Back up. And down. Okay, very straightforward. And just continue. And tie off the same. 
you'll just go back underneath your stitching, grab shallow, and tie off in the background. Now there's a little bit of a French knot. That's another fun one. That's the eye of the bird. I remember that one. So you'll come up and I think I have three strands here. If you're right-handed, you'll have this in your left hand, needles in your right. And I always like to practice if you spend a while. You might even want to do two wraps. You'd certainly want to be able to see the eye of that bird and you'll want to go right back down through that hole that you came up in. About lost my thread there. Of course, you wouldn't be doing this in a green. You'd be doing it in the coordinating, you know, whatever coordinating floss you want to use, black or dark brown. If you're like, you know, I want a bigger eye than that. I want that to be more significant. You can either add more strands of embroidery floss. This is only three. Or you can do more wraps. So let me show you what that would look like. Or let's go with three. So we have our needle here. We go one, two, and three. Now you don't want them to slip off there. So you have to kind of pivot that down. Notice I'm holding a little bit of tension off to the side with my finger here. And I don't let go of that until I absolutely have to. Otherwise, they can sometimes create a little bit of a tangled mess. So you can see two wraps three wraps. So you can decide the density of what you want. Now with that one, of course, you're going to have fusible webbing on top of here. You can again go shallow and grab kind of behind that fusible webbing and tie off. It's a little bit more tricky because you don't have all this big long row of stitching to <laughs> tie off with, but that's how you tie off with a French knot when that's the only embroidery in the area is there's fabric up here, of course, because you just embroidered on top of it, then I just go really shallow and make sure I didn't come all the way to the surface and then tie off as normal. So that should be all of the embroidery stitching in there. So I will go ahead and go off camera and do the rest of my stitching of my mustache and all the shapes with blanket stitch and straight stitch. And when I come back, we'll continue through the prog uh, progress of putting our stocking together. Okay, so I've sewn everything down in the coordinating thread. So much fun. You know, when I, I'm used to piecing quilts where I have a neutral thread in my machine all the time. So I really enjoy when I get to do some machine applique. So our next step, um, oh, I want to show this to you. Let's zoom in real quick. This one is done with the hand embroidery. And we had multiple strands of a, just a coordinating green and we did a stem stitch. This I went ahead and did on the machine. So you can see it still gives a, an even a lighter effect, but I used the dark green, this color, in fact, out of our thread set for both of those. So I just wanted to show you what that option was, and it was really a lot of fun. So, or again, do nothing at all. Okay, next step, now that we're kind of close up, we might as well just keep going here, is we get to put our buttons on. We definitely want to secure all of that before we start attaching the back because you can imagine trying to sew these on later would be very difficult to get in there. So now it's time to sew the buttons on. Sometimes when I have a lot of little buttons that are a little bit difficult just to even hang on to, I have found it at times, this is an option. If you wanted to do just a little bit of a dab of a glue based it, you'd want to make sure that you don't get any glue in those holes. You're just putting a little bit of a dab of glue and you're kind of arranging the cluster of your, I guess I would call them berries, right? We've got hollies and, and berries. The whole idea here is to just kind of group them. Notice there's two lighter red and one darker red. It's very subtle, but I can see that now that we're up close. You can either just start sewing them on and, and getting them in the vicinity, or if you're like, no, I want them to be like down. That's when you can just use a dab of glue and just turn that over. In fact, I'll try that real quick. It won't have time to dry though. That's the only downside. If I actually do this, I wanna be able to stitch this on with you. If I squeeze this bottle just a touch, I put a little bit of glue here and here, put them in position, do the same with that. I do the same with these eyes, although that'd be almost impossible to miss those holes. I, you might not want to you might want to just with a friction pen mark where you believe those eyes are going to be and that gives you a target of when you start putting needle let's put that like just like that and we can say that's where we want to have our 
That's where we want our buttons to be. And then here, again, if you want to, if you want to go ahead and glue that down or just go for it. A lot of times I just go for it. All right. I wanted to always give you options of things to consider. One of the things to keep in mind is we don't want to lose these buttons. These are specialty buttons. And we know if we're actually using the stocking year over year with gift cards or candy canes, this is a good size one. It's great to do with gift cards. You're going to use it year over year. You don't want to have a whole bunch of knots that with the friction of taking a card in and out, you're going to loosen that, maybe lose, um, uh, undo one of the knots. And so I like to try to keep, because I don't lose any buttons, I'm going to show you a technique. I'm just using some of the red. I just grab that and I grab a nice long length and there's a loop. It's one strand here, but I've doubled it up. I've just brought the two ends together and I'm just going to use my Richard Hemming. By the way, I did check these needles and they do go through here. I'll show you real quick. Even these smallest buttons, because I was like, I don't even think they're going to go through there. These are tiny, tiny buttons and they do. So that's a great needle. It'll work with all of the buttons. If you use anything like a uh, tapestry needle or a chenille needle, it's going to be too big. The eye will not work with those smallest buttons. So either use maybe a straw needle or the Richard Hemmings. Okay, so I want to show you this technique. So now I have two strands, excuse me, both ends one single strand and I've got this loop. Why I'm going to do that and I'm just going to come down straight down here. So I'm going to come straight down and I'm going to come straight back up right next to it. And I'm going to put my needle through this loop. What that does is it secures my needle, but I don't have a knot on the back. Because any knots, especially with friction and touching, can come undone and you lose a button. And of course, these are diff very difficult to find. Um, now, just as you would expect, they're hard to grab these little guys <laughs> with my nails. Um, I'm just going to come up through one hole, down to the next. I like to go through a button twice. I don't want to lose my buttons. So I just come up, go through that hole again. My hands are in the way. Sorry about that. Give it a nice good tug so that's not going anywhere. I know the beautiful part about this is too, besides the fact that the, there's no needle or no knot on the back, I've got two strands of thread and not one because we doubled it up the way we looped that, that single strand and we brought both. I now have two, the strength of two. And then we just come up and we put the neck. I'll just come up here, just like that. Pop on my next button. And this is assuming you didn't already glue them down in advance. And you just sew them on, just like that. And you can, you can finesse where they are, just pivoting them, and go down, just like that, and back up, and continue on. And as you would imagine to tie off. Now you will have a knot back here, but at least we're reducing the knots, right? There's no way to avoid that knot. But now I'm just going to show you the tie off here that I like to do, especially when I'm worried about a knot coming undone. I'll tie off once. Of course, I wouldn't have tied off yet. I'd tie those, I'd put those other buttons on. Tie off again for a second time. And then I also come in behind and shallow and I'll tie off and notice notice I've traveled a distance behind here I started here and I dragged that over there so this would have to somehow come undone and undo the knot which is highly unlikely so anytime I think there's a chance that I could rub off a, a button knot and lose my buttons I tend to take those extra steps so I'll continue sewing those other buttons on there. And I've got my two for the eyes. These are just adorable. When I first saw the ornaments in the book, I was sure these were French knots. I didn't even know they made buttons this small. They're so cute. 
I don't know why it's small is cute, but it just is. And then we'll sew this one on as well. So let me go ahead and get that taken care of. And then we'll be able to move on to the next step of making our ornaments. So I've got all the buttons stitched down. And I, you know, as I was looking in the book off camera, I noticed that their, their Santa has this great texture in his beard. If you look at the book, I love it. So, you know, normally I send my quilts out to be top quilted. I, I'm not an experienced long arm quilter at all, but I got a little foot loose and fancy free and decided to add some kind of loops and rolls and stitching. And, and so have fun with that. You know, that's, that may be not be your first language either to do top quilting, but don't be afraid, jump in there. Okay, let's move on into the book. The book has some great information coming up here. I want to encourage you to go ahead and refer to that. Our buttons are down. Hey, I added some little bit of top stitching. Uh, we're going to sew the remaining stocking top. Remember, we did that in the very beginning. And remember how one was pressed down the seam and the other one was pressed up. This is where it's going to come into play. We're going to pin the stocking front and the stocking back with the right sides together. And note that the backing, the stocking back doesn't have any batting in it. They talk about that. And that's because it's going to make, they say, this makes the stocking front have a nice curve when the stocking pieces are shown together. And you can see that it does. It's really nice. Shorten the stitch length to 1.5. So let's go ahead and place those right sides together. Remember how we had you um, have one pressed down and one pressed up? This is where it comes into play, right there. In that spot, that's the sweet spot, that's where we're going to put a pin right there, or a clip as you prefer. I'll just put a pin right there because I don't want to have to take the clip away. If I clip, I'm out here. If I pin, I can be on this side and leave my pins in place. Now down in here, I might even do some uh, clover. The uh, Even that is a little bit, and there's, there's a lot going on there, I can see. I might even grab my little mini wonder clips. Those would work even better. I've got my big ones right now, but I can see this would be actually better with uh, just they're smaller to deal with. Let's get in that spot again right there. I love having that interlocking seam. That's why we, we did what we did. We press one seam up and one seam down. And up here where we have just fabric, no fusible. Let's go ahead and get our patchwork pins going for us. So sometimes when I have that, it's a combination of patchwork pins, flower pins, and even wonder clips, and sometimes small and large. So you do whatever you need to do to get a project to come together and stay together. We want this to be perfectly aligned, stacked, staying stacked up on top of, right on top of each other. So we're going to clip, clip, clip. Our instructions have a sewing. Notice they have you starting at the very top, sewing a quarter inch all the way around, and be very consistent about that quarter inch seam. And don't sew across the top because, of course, that's our opening. So let's take that to our machine. Now, I've loaded the teal thread in because I know that my next step is actually making my hanger. So just to save myself a step, I went ahead and I'm sewing with a little bit of teal thread right now. But we're going to sew our standard quarter inch seam. Let's get started. Here we go, our next step. This is a really cool step too. This is a lot of fun with this one. I thought the construction was very unique, but let me go over that with you. So our next step here is trim the seam allowance to a generous eighth inch. So let's go ahead and do that. First, I forgot that, I, was, I jumped ahead. I was almost gonna skip that step. So we'll just trim that to a generous eighth. You could do it with a rotary cutter. I, I'm gonna go ahead and stick with my scissors <laughs> just because I have a little bit more control. 
Now they mentioned because we're trimming and because we had reduced our stitch length that we don't need to clip before we turn. Okay, let's put that aside. You know, these work great. They're Bordeaux by Clover, wonderful scissors. Um, Karen K. Buckley, anything. The Kai's can work, but that's a lot. It's a lot, it's a lot more strain because the, the loopholes or the kind of these are much smaller. I like the bigger handles when I'm cutting through a lot of bulk. Okay, you know, there's a little a little warble there. I'm gonna trim that with my my Kai's because I'm not, I don't have the bulk right here. Just trim that up. Okay. All right, our next step, and our natural inclination is to turn it through. Don't turn it through. Leave it this way, and then we're gonna press under a half inch on the stocking top. So you'll just turn that through. You know, I've got my hot ruler here. I don't think I actually, I brought it out just in case there was an opportunity to use it. I don't think we necessarily need to use that. Um, probably doesn't really, when you can get underneath something, it's great to use, but I can't really get underneath it. I don't have enough space here. But if I was doing a long run and had to turn something under half an inch and press it, I would use this. In this case, I'll use it as a mark measuring tool only. Since I have it out, okay. So they say press uh, press under, so we're gonna go ahead and press. Let's make sure we're even all the way around. And they give us a great diagram there. And then it says fold the stocking top to the inside of the stocking to just cover the seam line. So that's where our seam line is, is right here. And that's that, finally that aha moment that I had of like, ah, this is, this is why there was that, that difference in height. I have something to turn over now. So that's kind of your pivot point, is to turn that over. You can kind of feel that edge right there, just like that. So you're going to fold the stocking top to the inside of the stocking to just cover the seam line. So that's my seam line. I'm going to come down just a little bit further. I want to be able to cover that. Just a little bit more, just like that. And then it says, press the edge of the fold. And then we're going to, with a blind stitch by hand, and I've got a, a needle threaded here, with coordinating thread. Then I'm just gonna come in here with my needle and thread. Come down just a little bit further here. I'm just gonna scoop up in here, just like this, it's very shallow. I'm gonna bring that, roll that edge down just a touch and I'm gonna pick that up. Let me scoot that underneath there. I want to scoot that top down just a little bit more here. I'm going to repress that. I want that seam to be fully covered there, just like that. Now, I come very shallow and I just pick up the edge right there. Just pick it up. And you just keep traveling, shallow, because remember, this is the right side of the, orna of, the, of the stocking ornament. So I'm trying to be just on this side and not go all the way through. And if you kind of get into the meat, let me show you that. If you kind of get into the meat of the seam allowance, that's on this side. This, you can see my needle comes all the way through. But the seam is only back here. So I'm kind of digging into that. That's where I'm kind of burying the stitches right there. If you can kind of see that right along there. So I'll keep, I'll keep carrying along. I'll go all the way around and I'll just tie off back here. Do it one more time so you see 
how shallow that is. I want you to definitely see that. So I go grab that seam allowance right there, and then I'm getting, so now I have both of them. And then you'll just keep going. Okay, let me go finish that up, and then we're going to go work on our hanger when we come back. Okay, so we have that cuff whip stitched down. Let's go ahead and turn our ornament through our stocking. So fun. I've got my clover point turner, my favorite go-to. I'll get that mostly turned through and then we'll use that. Um, if you have not already subscribed, by the way, I bet you already have, but just in case you haven't, um, do that right now. We, you know, we love to bring new video content and that way you get to know, you get alerted when there's new content. So that's always great. So I'll use my clover point turner. As I was saying, if you've really watched any of my videos, you see us use this so much because it works. It's got the nice curve when you want the curve. It's got the nice point when you've got the points and it's all in one tool. Clover uh, notions are all made in Japan. And you know, that's the craftsmanship of the Japanese um, nation is amazing. I've always been impressed with their fabric. I've been impressed with everything that they do. So I can't, I can't recommend those notions enough for quality and utility. And they really do solve problems, right? They make, they make those notions that are like, oh, thank goodness someone made that notion. Okay, so let's jump right back in. I got so excited talking about Clover's products and how impressed I am with them. They talk about turning the stocking right side out and they say finger roll and press around the stocking seam. I can feel that in here to smooth the seams and curves. And if you want, just press around the outside edge so you don't press out the quilting details. So let's go ahead and we'll do that. I think my, I think my iron's heated up. Let's see here. Nope, while I was doing that hand sewing down, it cooled down. But, you know, the nice thing about using a wool pressing mat that we have found is it seems like somehow, because of maybe the density of the mat, I don't know what it is, that it's totally different than my ironing board at home. And I barely use my ironing board at home anymore because it seems like these mats I can press and that it doesn't just mash everything. It seems like it allows everything to still stay beautifully lofted. So I just know that if I'm going to press, of course, I don't want to touch the hot iron with those, um, touch the buttons with the hot iron. So that's why I'm ironing from this side. And I just know my wool pressing mat is forgiving and I can really press it out. And you can see everything still stays beautifully lofted. So. I don't think you need to worry too much about not being able to press, but just press from the back side. Okay. Well, every stocking needs a hanger, and this is one of the things where we differ just a little bit. Um, we'll make the hanger exactly the way that they say, but how we attach it is a little bit different. So let me call your attention to the book. I'll show you here and as well from the overhead. You can see once they made their hanger, theirs goes from the left side all the way over to the right side. Whereas the stockings that I grew up with always had the hanger just on the one side. So you can absolutely cover, uh, use the instructions in the book and have your top from one side to the other if that's what you prefer. And I'll touch on that just a little bit, or I'll show you how to be able to do it where that same loop is only on the one side. But to get them prepared, we're gonna absolutely follow the exact same instructions. And that's where we'll get to be able to use our hot ruler. Even this is pre-cut to the exact size for you and your kit, so you don't need to even worry about cutting that out. Um, we'll grab our hot ruler, and the, the instructions have us turning the two ends under by a quarter of an inch. And I've got my quarter inch here. I'm just going to bring this right up to my pressing mat. Normally, you know, I'm having to just eyeball. Well, that's, that's about a quarter of an inch. But with the hot ruler, I love that I can be specific. I could sit here all day with this iron on top of this a hot ruler, and it absolutely tolerates that, and it doesn't fail. It just pulls off. It's just the coolest material you've ever, ever worked with. It's really a fantastic. We'll repeat that on the other end. So whether I want to do a quarter inch, half, three quarters, or whatever, two, up to two and a half, 
if, I, if someone said, turn it under one and a quarter, I don't know where one and a quarter is, but my ruler does, my heart ruler does, I should say, and I would just turn it under until I had that. You know what I'm saying? You get the idea that this is a very versatile tool, and when you need precision and you want to find the exact measurement and be able to iron right, right on top of it, this is one you want to definitely invest in. Okay, so that's done. Now our next step will be to just fold this right sides, excuse me, wrong sides together. And we're just going to make a crease here. And that's going to be our target. I'm getting that out of the way so you can see what I'm doing here. I'll try to get my head out of the way. Now we'll open that up and that center line crease is where we're going to fold toward. This is a great technique anytime you want to add a hanger to something. Just use this technique. It works great. Any length that works best for you. And then we'll just fold those together. And uh, now we've got everything ready to go. No raw edges. And we've loaded in the color thread that we're going to need. And we have a nice teal. All right, I have a starter strip. I have this ready to go. Now just keep in mind, because we're going to see the thread on both sides, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and wind a bobbin. This is really the first time that you've probably had to do that, unless here you decided to wind bobbins. You know, you're gonna do 12 ornaments. It does make sense to go ahead and have red in the bobbin so you don't risk a white coming to the top. But in case you haven't, now you definitely want to go ahead and do that. So I've got teal on the top and the bottom. We'll start with our starter strip. We'll come right in with our fabric afterward. Now we can talk about the two different ways to attach the hanger. If you decide to go with what's in the book, we have our ornament here. And from what I am getting from this, uh, they talk about pinning the handle about one inch inside of one side of the stocking, and that would be down here, and stitch in the ditch on the outside seam line at the top of the stocking to secure the handle. Now, that is tricky, no question about that. It may be even easier to do by hand. You're going through a lot of thickness but if you are able to, you'd be taking off this plate, trying to open up the stocking and stitch in there and kind of stitch in that ditch. And you know, you'd want to probably stitch right in here. Now that's, and you would do the same on the opposite side. And that's how they have their stocking being displayed on one side to the other. Of course, you know, you can always come up with your own variation. You know, that's one of those things in crafting where you do what works best for you. As I said, my experience with stocking has always been that they've been on the same side. So what the, we first did was went ahead and crisscrossed those and took that to the machine. So let's go ahead and do that. Keep moving. I'm just gonna back across that. And go forward again and we'll just stop that there we go and now how do we attach this thing so I want to show that to you you just move this out of the way put that here bring that over of course you'd have coordinating thread and you want to stay on that side on the teal side uh, so that when your stitches through you're kind of trying to go right in that ditch see that seam line 
option one. That's going to depend on your comfort level. If you're like, I really am not comfortable with that. The next option, go ahead. We know that this is here, but you need to be able to get your needle down in that corner. Go ahead and just roll that back down just a touch, just like that. You could turn it back through if you want all the way, but it's not needed. And I'm just going to put that right there. And I'm just going to start here just to kind of get myself going and just stitch it in place by hand. Now, don't worry if it's your, your needle is going to have to come onto the back, but remember you're using coordinating thread. It's a little bit dark where I am, but I'm going to try to, I can now direct my needle to be in the ditch. Now, use a thimble here. I'm going through a lot of layers. I don't have a thimble with me. I'm just having to work slowly, but I know it's a little bit of a little bit difficult, but it's a really small area. And as cute as these stockings are, they're absolutely worth a little bit of extra effort. So that's all stitched down. And then we'll tie off as we normally good really well, of course. Just do that real quick. But, but well, it's not going to fall apart on us because we want to have these for a long time. Just like that. We have two of these ornaments now. Oh my gosh, they are adorable. I'm just going to give it one more press. I've kind of fiddled with it a little bit here. So there's our finished ornament. Thank you for hanging in there with me today. That's been a longer video, but I didn't want to leave any any step unresolved. I wanted you to be able to get your kit and be able to know how to make these adorable ornaments from start to finish. So thank you so much, and I'll see you on a future shabby video.